roughly speaking, a third of our energy, human consumed energy goes to making things. And making stuff is literally just look around the room. Look around, nothing in here has been made without heat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm looking around my office and yep, that's what I'm saying. The longer I've spent time at Rondo, the more I see like, oh my God, the type of customers we're talking to. I mean, they're just very basic things. Welcome to the Energenius Podcast with Joe Patch the Fourth. I want to welcome everyone to another episode of the Inner Genius Podcast. I'm very excited to have on a very wonderful, talented guest, a friend of mine, Kareem Ebrick. He's the EVP over at Rondo. We've been looking to set up this interview for a long time. I'm so glad you could make some time to be here. Kareem, great to have you. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. I'm glad to be here. Wonderful. Well, look, let's get kicked off right away, right? So one of the things I like to talk about on this show is I like to get into people's backgrounds. Mm -hmm. You know, how did you get into you know, the role that you're in today, right? I mean, obviously you're an engineer, you took a, an interesting path starting in Texas and coming out to the West Coast. So walk us in that journey. How did you kind of get to where you are today? Yeah, um, I, you know, I, I, I really, I, I, start, I studied chemical engineering in undergrad um, and, um, you know, I, 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 most of that time was really actually spent in Qatar uh, of all places. Uh, Texas A&M had a, had a branch campus um, over there. Um, and, and really focused on energy um, and, and in a very traditional sense. It was very fossil, fossil fuel based. Okay. Um, and um, during that time, you know, I was really kind of thinking about academia as my path. Uh, and so I was, I, I was doing research. I think, you know, really within two months, I was already an RA for, um, for, a, for, a, for, a, for a professor there, um, you know, doing kind of uh, chemistry in the lab, helping him out. And, um, and I was doing well at it, right? I, I uh, think by first my, by my by the end of my freshman year, I got, was invited to uh, this big conference in the states uh, for chemical engineers, and I I won an award for this molecular claw that thing that we were doing in the lab that I was trying to uh -huh. isolate for him, and you know and and so you know I jumped from that to this this next guy that was studying this this interesting process called uh, gas to liquids, you know, converting uh -huh. converting gas into uh, liquid fuel into chemicals. Um, and then, you know, the thesis behind gas to liquids really goes all the way back, um, or really anything to liquids, goes all the way back to uh, Germany and during the World War. Um, uh, I believe it was World War uh, One, um, where, you know, they got embargoed and had to turn, you know, needed to run, run their engines. And so they started converting like, coal into liquids, right? So they started inventing this process. And then South Africa did the same during, during the embargo around them as well. And then... And then, you know, it kind of there was a bit of a pivot in the 70s with, with Saudi, um, uh, you know, shutting, shutting off its taps to the Western world um, that, you know, got, got this X to liquids back up and say, hey, how do we make liquids from stuff? So anyway, so this is the stack that's kind of mysterious in the, in the background. It's going to be relevant because we're going to talk about where this tech is showing up right now in the climate tech. Um, so I started working with this professor and he happens to be like a kind of world renowned guy working in this process, right? Um, anyway, so I did that for three years with this guy. I, I couldn't leave him. I was kind of by his side. Um, okay. About to, you know, go out into the academia world. And um, in comes my dean and says, you're not fit for academia. I uh, I know you enough. Um, <laughs> the dean of the engineering school. It's like, you need to go out to the field and um, and learn. Um, and so, uh, and learn I did. I uh, ended up uh, working at Shell. Uh, I, I joined them and uh, they were commissioning a large gas to liquids plant. Same Where was it located? In Qatar. In Qatar, yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Uh, really big. I mean, this is, uh, you know, you know, do dozens of billions of dollars uh, with wow. facilities. Um, and I kind of joined them early, early, early days in its operation, uh, did a number of uh, pretty fun engineering roles, so kind of really built my technical shops, kind of learned, learned okay. process, learned framework, learned problem solving, mm -hmm. uh, and found myself in a very interesting position. Um, you know, kind of being moved into this this operations manager type role, but without any mm -hmm. reports. So I have to like really run, uh, manage um, indirectly through influence. All okay. the engineers sat somewhere, all the maintenance folks sat somewhere. Right, right. Staff sat with ops supervisors, but I was a problem solver. I got to work through them. So I had to develop the skill influencing without authority, essentially. Uh -huh. And it happened to be at this time where, you know, um, you run a plant and the first few years is really hard. Right, you got a lot of commissioning right. problems, but then right. if it's in tech, which is what this was, right, 
to show up a little bit later, right? And they're, they're much hairier, more technically um, convoluted, you know, and really complex stuff. So I went through that phase with this plant and, and I happened to be in that role in the heart of the plant. Um, and so there was a lot of learning for me okay. um, in a very rapid pace. I was definitely fire, you know, in a firefighting kind of mental mm -hmm. state. Um, right, right. That's where really my le leadership chops got built uh, there. By the end of that, you know, I, I really figured, you know, that's that's too much firefighting for me. Um, right. I, I want to step back and think. It's been a minute <laughs> since right, I thought, right, right. Um, ended up joining um, or forming, helping form this investigation unit, um, reporting, you know, straight to the plant manager on, on, on the major incident, major incidents that have, you know, cost the company, you know, really lots and lots of money have been investigated and couldn't be solved. And they came back. Mm -hmm. uh, these, are, these are things that, you know, dozens of engineers have looked at, you know, from headquarters, from, you know, HQ, you know, helicopters over and still couldn't figure it out. <laughs> we, we formed this unit of multidisciplinary engineers sitting in a room and got, got through it. But kind of what, what's interesting is around this time, I'm sitting there and problem solving all these things. Um, you know, I start, um, well, I meet this wonderful uh, person, uh, Zineb, my, my wife now, um, who's, who's a, lot more worldly, <laughs> a lot more worldly, uh, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so she she knows about politics and the whole how the whole world works and all that stuff. Right. And right. I'm sitting there, I'm like, I'm just an engineer. I really like my I like problem solving. That's kind of you know, give me a hard problem, I'll be happy forever. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so she starts kind of introducing me to some things that I I frankly never thought about. Um, it's not it wasn't common in the Middle East to think this way or you know think mm -hmm. about problems. Climate change was one of them. Okay. But what something entered my mind, which is like I don't really know how the world works you know, mm -hmm. on a fundamental level. Like I studied engineering. I, I didn't do any classes, any electives that are related uh, to um, business yeah. policy. I was, I was on my way to academia, right? I was going, you know, deeper, like mass right. transfer class three, thermodynamics, advanced level four. <laughs> it was just, you know, yeah. getting deeper into it. Um, and so kind of around that time, I figured, look, I, you know, I want to, you know, I did, my, I did my technical upbringing at Shell. I learned a lot, but I wanted to do something else. Sure. Um, I wanted to learn about uh, the world, but I wanted that something else. I wanted to, I had this vision of like creating jobs, like mm -hmm. building a new thing that was like, Hey, I can employ people. Right. I can, I can, I can see a project get built. You know, right, there's, right, right. Like, I, I had this vision of like, that's, that's cool. That that's something new, right. Rather than maintaining an existing thing. Cause I was an operator. Right. Right. Um, right, right. And, and that's, that's how I landed on, you know, doing business school. Okay. And, um, and tacking on a master's of science in um, essentially in energy. But why? Why? Well, let me yeah. ask you, why in the United States? I mean, you could have gone yeah. and studied in Europe. You know, why? Why here? Why Stanford? What was the what was the draw? Yeah, I mean, I looked at all the programs. Um, mm -hmm. I looked at a lot of programs for me. Okay. I was looking for a program that sort of covered this, you know, being a good business school. Yep. One thing. But um, I really wanted I really wanted access to energy like climate tech new energy right. transition all that stuff okay and i think Stanford offered this program this mba masters of science combo um okay. and in addition to being situated right in the middle of silicon valley with all these startups happening around that are yeah. in this space, um you know a lot more to say about that but um sure. yeah you know i made a bet that that was the right environment for me right right and, and then the second thing that i liked about the school was more on a cultural side like I, I think when I, by the time I left Shell, I got really hammered into my head. Like, you know, you got to be risk averse, risk averse, calculate all the risks. Yeah. Just, yeah. So it's, it's all an equation, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I realized like that was one way of seeing how the world should be, right? Or how, sure. you know, one way to problem solve. And there was something around the madness of entrepreneurship that I just couldn't understand. And it okay. was like, you know what? I want to be. I want to kind of sit in a different culture. I want to. I want right. to. I want to sit in something else, something right. so far away from what I know, just to, just to challenge myself. And For and sure. I thought that was that was it. There was something around that that was appealing. Right. And I resisted it, man. When I first came here, I'm like, this is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, funny. Um. Yeah. So I, I I I you know fast forward, came to business school. Um, yeah. I think very quickly, uh, I was very fortunate that, you know, I didn't calculate for this, but there's not not a lot of people in Silicon Valley that have really like touched valves and sort of worked on, you know, really seen a pipe in the field, et cetera. Yep. So I found myself yep, quickly getting pulled into looking at different technology companies, helping tech mm -hmm. startups kind of get off the ground, advising right. them on 
technical matter. So it was like a technical kind of advisory moving slowly into, hey, can, can you join us? Like, can you work on this problem? Um, and I ended up finding myself at an investing firm um, that, you know, kind of gave me that, that, that base to just right. you know really start learning and working with a partner on understanding sure. businesses. Right. Um, and so suddenly tech and business sort of came together uh, mm -hmm. for that I call it almost apprenticeship. Um, right. And, right. And, and I think that was, that was my moment of really breaking in uh, into, you know, really kind of the business side, business building and company. Mm -hmm. building. And then, yeah, the rest is sort of uh, here we are. I mean, the, we ended up spinning out the H cycle out of that investment firm. I was right. asked to jump in. Help them help sure. get that going. You interviewed Rob Morgan, the CEO of H Cycle, um, yeah. uh, friend of mine. So we ended up uh, going and building that. Um, and then, you know, once I found that in a in a, in a decent spot uh, for me, yeah. uh, ended up, you know, really, really getting that itch again, wanting to go earlier, wanting to go to even more unexplored tech. Uh, so right, yeah, right. more and more into this, you know, risk risk taking. Um, and that's how I ended up at Rondo um, okay. uh, um, uh, around a year ago. <clears throat> Well, well, no, I appreciate the, uh, the, uh, you know, the background. I, I mean, the, the texture is really fascinating. I, you know, I have a lot of these conversations um, with folks and you look at their career path and oftentimes it is very meandering. Mm -hmm. And I think that that needs to be seen more as normal as, as opposed to abnormal. A lot of people want to see kind of up into the right at a 45 degree angle all the time. And, it, and that's just not life. Um, and quite frankly, I think if you break that down, it'd be pretty sterile really at the end of the day. Um, there, you know, there's no variability in it. Um, I, I don't know. I think the fun would, would, would fail to exist in that, in that particular equation. But the thing that I also like about what you said too, is that, you know, having spent time around the work, I mean, what a concept. I mean, you, you know, you, you, some people have worked in a space a long time, but have never really been around the work or the final product or been on a project or, you know, mm -hmm. boots on the ground. And, I personally think it's really, really valuable. Your perspective that you bring to the thinking and to the application is so different because you can appreciate the challenges that do exist in the field that are real, that every project has to face whether you like it or not. And if you design without that intent, mm -hmm. you set yourself up for a lot of problems. Your risk profile is significantly greater. So I, I love the fact that you bring that in because I think it adds a, a, a layer that is, uh, is is elegant, really, at the end of the day, you know, it just it adds to the solutions that you can bring to the table. So I kind of yeah. love that backstory. I appreciate you bringing that up. And I also think, too, it ties into a, a podcast I did here a while back with a gentleman talking about the same thing. You know, your first job, you know, you you can't see it as just a paycheck. It, yes, mm -hmm. it's a path to where you want to go. Right. And, 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 and it's a journey, but really make the most of it, you know, really dive in, really understand what it is you're doing get to have, you know, have, make some mentors, get to know people, ask lots of questions. Cause you'll be surprised sometimes I've seen in my own life, 2020 hindsight, how that first job or two that maybe wasn't your dream job to some extent, it turns out to be a blessing in disguise. You know, some of the, the lessons learned that you take away that you now apply, uh, it can be pretty profound. So I appreciate that, that, uh, that backstory. What a, what a journey. Um, so now here we are, we're, we're over at Rondo, right? We're taking on clean tech. And um, what are your, you know, what are your, why do you want to pursue this particular technology? I mean, what is it about Rondo that's unique? I yeah. mean, you have opportunity to work with different companies. This is something that obviously presented itself and you decided to latch onto. It wasn't the only thing, but yeah. why, why them? Why these guys? Why this tech? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I met Rondo, I uh, met John, the CEO of Rondo, really early, actually, when they found it, okay. you know, from that investment role that I, I found myself in. Um, okay. Did not stop thinking about it. You know? Really? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, okay. It was just always in the back of my mind, like, hey, I wonder how those guys are doing. Um, okay. You know, I was I was at the time building age cycle with Rob, and, you know, I, you right. know, we kept in touch a little bit. I never, ever imagined that I'd end up here, right? It was, it was, right. I was so curious. Um, let me tell you why I was curious. That's there's, good, yeah. there's there's two aspects to this, I think. I'm going to try to keep them at two. I think there's probably many more. <laughs> um, the first one is, you know, what am I bringing that's unique to this mm -hmm. something, right? So in H-Cycle, I brought, I brought all this technical knowledge on a process mm -hmm. that H-Cycle uses that I knew a lot about. Right. Shot, right? It was gasification. It was hydrogen. Absolutely. You know, it was um, a chemical reaction type stuff. Right, right up your alley. Right yep. Absolutely no problem. We can do that all day. Um, 
with Rondo, you know, this perspective, the, the, my, my perspective kind of evolved a little bit. It was like, okay. you know, what am I bringing that's unique? Well, you know, it's, it's early days. They're scaling the business. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, um, they're going after industrial heat, right? Um, you know, processes that, you know, I've, I've worked a lot around industrial heat. We certainly made a lot of heat and consumed a lot of heat. And so I, right, I right. have a good feeling for the type of customer okay. they're going after. Um, and so I, I had, a, you know, that was my, that was my unique fit was like, that was one of it. The second is they're going to be building a lot of things. And like, like you said, exactly what you said, it's like, you gotta, you gotta build with the end in mind, you know, you gotta yes. really understand it. It's about schedules, timelines, permits, et cetera. Um, uh, yep. the balance of plant, all, all yep. these, all these considerations. And yep. I, I think you know, I can be really uniquely suited to add value on that, in that front and really sure. build a safety culture quite early, et cetera. So there's a, there's a bunch there um, that really excited me um, uh, in my fit to that, to that company. Mm -hmm. um, why Rondo itself, um, big, big, hairy problem that absolutely has a completely blank slate ahead of it we don't know how to industrialize and de decarbonize industry without de-industrializing mm. right that was how that's that was you know that was that was that's the thinking that i came right. that i that i kind of got to um before i started looking at technologies like rondo i was right. like i don't understand how we're going to fix this um mm -hmm. and, and you know meeting Rondo, i'm like hey maybe this maybe this could work um but then it, it it had to hit a couple of things for me. So you know, not only is this a big a big problem, I like I like such things. Um, it also had to make sense. So you know, um, are there air emissions? Because if you got air emissions, this thing can't scale very well. You know, it's you got you got to deal with permitting cycles, etc. No air emissions. Check. Yeah. Hey, right. what's the minimum viable economies of scale? You know, right. do I, I got to build a billion dollar plant to make this work, or can I, can right. I make this happen at smaller tickets? Run yep. to take a box. Mm -hmm. Am I going against or with the macro wave? When our, our, our macro wave is electrification, you know, mm -hmm. solar getting cheaper, wind getting cheaper, is grid grids getting more volatile, grids needing yep. the loads. Check, check, check. Right. And so, yeah. you know, without going into all of the lists, I, I had this sort of checklist of things that I found my favorite type of companies. Mm -hmm. had. And my and and some and some of those you know fears that I, I dealt with at you know H cycle for instance that I kind of sure. wanted to say wow you know I'm glad we've solved them there but those were not easy to solve I don't I don't want to I don't want to deal with that again right um, right um, and so that yeah so Rhonda really ticked tick the box for me on that front as well that's interesting I, I mean kind of how you kind of come at it um, you know coming from a viability perspective right you have your sort of criteria in your mind that that you're looking to address and how you know, sort of one by one, this is, this seems to be checking oh. off what, what, what obviously is incredibly interesting to you and incredibly relevant, you know, and that's kind of a pivot into the next question a little bit. I mean, looking at where we are today in the world, you know, and the work that needs to be done. I mean, what kind of market are, are we talking about when we look at industrial decarbonization mm -hmm. um, and being able to scale something, you know, like a Rondo as it impacts the market? I mean, what type of market opportunity do we really have here? Yeah, yeah. Um, have, uh, I want to dive into that. I just want to circle back real quick to that one. Please. Yeah. When looking for a gig like this one, especially joining a startup, you got to yep. think about it as an investment decision. You, know, mm. you are investing your time mm -hmm. and reputation and sacrifice. Right. Startups are not easy. You know, you're sacrificing for your family. Like there's, yeah. there's a lot that goes into that, um, you know, Treat it like an investment decision. Like, really, can this make sense? Is I really is this really going to pencil? Um, right. I think a lot of people are focused on the gig, the job, my boss. Who, but you got to look at the company. Um, and I, I think that's just one one quick kind of one quick side. But that that's why you have to go through a kind of checklist process in my mind before before you join a startup. Um, yeah, yeah. I like how you said that too. No, were you? No, I like how you said that too because I mean, I, I you know, you and I have had a chance to work together, and you, you're incredibly busy. I mean, you're you're working a lot, and I, I can imagine you know you're thinking about things even kind of off the clock, if you will, right? And I, I I've never heard someone kind of lay it out just the way you did, kind of an investment decision. But that's yeah, I mean, I, I really like that, I guess, because it, it it there are different parts of what would make an opportunity intriguing to lots of people. But I I think that you know maybe this kind of goes with the with the uh, the old adage that you're the ten year overnight success. You know, it's like you. 
you build something after 10 years, it's doing very, very well. And people want to just say, well, that, you know, he just got lucky. It was an overnight thing. And it's like, no, you weren't there the first five years when I worked, you know, six days a week, long hours, and you weren't there to take the risk and you didn't take that line of credit. And, you know, you didn't dodge a couple of bullets along the way to get to where we are today that has allowed us to realize the success we're at because we've taken the risk, so to speak. But but you're right. The investment of time particularly is very real. And I think to exclude that or to think somehow it's a 40 hour week job, you're just mistaken, you know? Yeah. No, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Yeah. No, p- please. Yeah. You were going to dovetail into yeah, the, on the, market. Kind of the, the market. Yeah. On the market. I mean, we can break and segment it quite, you know, at a very high level here and then and okay. dig into wherever we want to go. Um, you know, roughly speaking, a third of our energy, human mm-hmm. consumed energy goes to making things. Okay. Right. Um, you know, and, you know, roughly proportionally speaking, it's around a third of our emissions. And, and making, making stuff is just literally just look around the room. Look around, nothing in here has been made without heat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm looking around my office and yep, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah it's every single thing on here. It's, 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 um, and, yeah, and yeah. the more I've been in, the more I've been, the longer I've spent time at Rondo, the more I see like, oh my God, the type of customers we're talking to. I mean, they're just very basic things need mm-hmm. heat. Um, and so that heat, roughly speaking, is, you know, probably around half of that heat sits in making steam. Okay. So it's literally boiling water, um, okay. you know, various pressures and temperatures and kind of, and the reason you boil water a lot of the time is you kind of, you want to move that heat around, and, you know, water is a good way to move heat around, right? Okay. Around, around the plant. Um, and, and then the other balance, ba- the balance of that heat is, is more complicated, you know, you either got you know, hot air, big dryers, kind of kind of unique equipment that's that's okay. somehow generating that heat um, in in a, in a fancy way. Okay. Yeah, and then um, and, and but if you really look at it from from an in- industry perspective, you know, you got everything: steel, cement, baby food, textiles, plastic, paper, wood. It's yep. just it's all across, and every region has a different spread of what those industries are. I mean, you really look at, you're looking at a country's economy, you know, and you go there and you're like, hey, it's interesting. You can actually, one of the things I asked one of my team to do was like, hey, look at CO2 per capita. Mm. Find out where, where are we, where are we heavily industrialized, you know, um, relative mm-hmm. to others. That's the big picture uh, perspective. The other, the other thing I want to add, um, the other thing I want to add on, on the steam side with industrial heat is around, if you look at power, which is around a third of our, roughly a third of our energy consumption. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, a very large chunk of that also involves boiling water and making okay. steam, using that velocity of steam to turn turbines or uh, tur- yep. turbines and make power, right? Yep. So yep. here we are as Rondo looking at the world, you know, here's where heat exists right now. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. So what, what, what markets you think are the ripest? I mean, which, and, and I say ripest, but I think that's a combination between there's an opportunity for great market share but there's mm-hmm. also a leaning in of, mm-hmm. of who they are that would embrace, you know, the the the, the technology, the you know, call it the risk. Uh, we, you know, we want to you know, sure up the, the green side of our company. Um, I'm curious, what are the top couple? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a great it's a great question, uh, Joe. Um, well, you know, it's it's there's an easy answer and there's a there's a hard answer. I think that the easy answer is anything consumer facing right now is seeing. Okay. The, um, they're sort of mitigating their risk, yep. right? In the future, um, you know, brands that you can recognize um, sure. have have you know spoken out and said, "Hey, I'm going to go carbon neutral by this date," uh, you know, and then and then and then they got challenged and say, "Hey, carbon neutrality in 2050 could mean that you can just decarbonize in 2049, right?" <laughs> so right, right, right. right. They're setting these more, I would say, tangible, shorter term targets, and right. you know, you jump you jump on a call with them, and it's just like. Yeah, it's really hard actually, right? We got to get this by 2029, man. You got to start projects today, right? Yep. You're not buying a fossil fuel boiler today if you want to be carbon zero by 2050. And so, so it's it's a it's a complex it's yep. a complex situation for these guys. It, it's dying. difficult, yeah. But you know, that, so that's one side. That's that's that kind of pressure. But at the end of the day, I think the way my team operates is there's a CFO in these companies, right? Yep. Someone's trying to like solve for, you know, are you making more money or less money? And a lot exactly. of it short term centered still. It's not really? that effective long term brand. Yeah. I don't think is is yet as dominant 
as as those things as the as a shorter term like we still have to pencil against fossil fuel right you just have mm -hmm. to do that um and i think that's where now that gets that gets into the kind of the trade secret or the special sauce but you know rondo ultimately arbitrages intermittent power mm -hmm. and the, that cost of that intermittent power yeah. against whatever the consumer customer uh, is um is whatever the price or shadow price is of steam or heat on their site by buying fossil fuel and maybe paying for um, a carbon price or dealing with a regulator on some right. air emission or or potentially even looking at expanding their steam on site but being unable to get an air permit. So they're doing a yep. lot of math around well, ultimately kind of basic just economics. And I think that has to look good. Right there, it's it's hard to make a project happen with just oh we got to meet our targets so we got to decarbonize. Sure. I, I'm not yeah. that I, I don't, I'm not a big believer that that's that's the engine that's going to make this all work. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. And, yeah. and, and and Joe, I think maybe as a last point here, and I don't think we want that to be the engine necessarily. That yeah. will result in a more expensive world for all of us. I think we should do our utmost to find ways, viable ways. Uh. To make to 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 make make clean energy cheaper than fossil fuel, um, and and do yeah. our best try do our best there, um, ASAP, yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's interesting. I mean, how you you know, you talk about penciling against against you know a fossil, right? And it, it's interesting because the, the mix will will not remain the same. And so you know when you look at these long term projects and you say to yourself, well, we're gonna even if you put escalators in, I mean, the reality is the energy mix is changing constantly. And so I, I you know, I'm, I'm not a CFO, but I, I think you got to be careful how you hedge some of this stuff too, because uh, as, as the mix of power changes and you see more renewable power come on the grid, more distributive generation, um, it's going to change the economics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I guess the question is, you know, if you're not using that in the model, then you're you're taking some real false assumptions. Yeah. So, I mean, just on the practical side, I see that being an issue. I, I can totally relate to the long-term lead on, on equipment. I mean, if you want a project and, and you think you might be getting somewhere a couple of years down the road, I remember with gas turbines years ago. I mean, they were years out. I mean, people would horse, horse trade in the queue. Sometimes yeah. people would add an extra one, right? Just because I know someone's going to need it really bad. I can make a couple million bucks by basically having a slot in the queue. I mean, all kinds of games going on. But, you mm. know, to think that... I, I think that's the kiss of death to think that you can address these changes in sort of real time is, is, is not being honest. You know, th this is a, it's, it, it's, it's a long term to, to get everything done, everything from equipment to looking at the, at the power mix long term. And so to your point, what, what's really the, uh, you know, what's, what's the, what's driving this, right? What's the Genesis? Where, where are you, where in the why? Um, I think you're right on the consumer facing type stuff too. I mean, just that bottle of water I was drinking, I mean, huge on the back. Yeah. They, they have a very extensive part on the back, giving you clear indication where they are, carbon neutral, why, what they took to get there, you know, given the backstory. It's great. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's right there. Uh, and I think a lot of people want to see it, but I think, I think more and more people are demanding it too. Yeah. And, and quite frankly, you know, you know how it is, you vote with your wallet. You know, if a brand is unwilling to do what you want, there's brands I don't buy on, on purpose for various reasons. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I think you're starting to see some of that, a little more of that polarization come into play as well. I think the past, uh, you know, the past, I think, decade of business has, you know, really been, that's been central as a theme. I think, you know, sitting in business school recently, yep. we're finishing that, that was like, there's not a week would pass without someone bringing up, hey, we're in a, we're in a value centered consumer world now. Yeah. It's a different world. Um, it is. You know, it's 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 interesting to watch um how businesses navigate that. Um we yeah. do see the effect of that, that's for sure. Um on yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you, I mean, you know, you guys, I mean, looking at where you are in the technology right now, where where would you say you know, Rondo is in that cycle of we've we've really kind of um you know, we've ironed it all out, right? I mean, I don't know that it's possible to iron out all the bugs of a technology. I, I think it'll, to some extent, there'll always be an evolution. And, and to some extent, I think you should want one. You should always want to try to push 
any any technology to the to the highest degree of efficiency possible. And as time goes on, you know, you, there's our breakthroughs or our new, you know. So I, it, it's where do you where do you think you are on that scale now of never reaching a hundred, but where are we at? It's it's kind of like I I would put us in like Tesla Roadster days, you know, like ah, I know? just drove one like, of those a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. it's like it works. Um, it's 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 bloody painful to make. Okay. Um, but you ju you just wait, right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know, spending just uh, ten minutes with my CTO, you'd, you'd already see um, yeah a plethora of ideas on how okay. this thing is going to to get to something very different um, over time, uh, cost wise, right. efficiency wise, um, the types of temperatures it's going to reach. It's, it's it's we're just getting started. Um, but well, in terms of the core tech, like the principles, I would say the physics right. principles. That's demonstrated, and it's demonstrated in an industrial environment. You know, receiving intermittent power, mm -hmm. discharging it to different set points, mm -hmm. uh, even changes in ambient temperature, changes in feed water temperature, um, mm -hmm. you know, sudden shutdowns, etc. It's all all in there, and it's been it's been running, and we inspect mm -hmm. it regularly. Um, so we're very okay. proud um, of the, the the fundamentals being being proven right now. I think we're entering an interesting phase where okay. you know it's. Construct construction, yep. and supply chain and execute execution. And how do we how do we get smart there? I think that's yep. the phase right now. That's where that's where most attention is going. Okay, um, you know, now that the physics is behind us. Yeah, right, right. Well, and, and I mean that's you know kind of the classic. You you get better on project two, three, four, five, and six. Um, you know, in terms of the constructability, but also in terms of the heat units themselves. Right. What what sizes are you at right now? And are and you are you ultimately looking to modularize? You know what? What are what are these units um, over time? Yeah. I, so if you if you look at our web web page, and I and I have to kind of um, dance around what's publicly disclosable sure. information um, here because there's 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 a lot of thinking happening in house for sure. Um, you yeah. know, we got the two megawatt hour unit right now that's running. Um, okay. Uh, you know, from a fundamental, what what is the module for us? Our module is the is the brick with mm -hmm. the heater wire. Um, assembled in exactly a certain geometry, geometry mm -hmm. of creating physics that I'm, I'm referring to. Um, right. Going bigger than that is just more bricks. Right? Okay. It's in okay. All, you know, in, in two dimensions, basically. Okay. Um, and so, um, you know, our, our, our core product offerings right now are the RHB 100, which is a 100 megawatt hour unit. Mm -hmm. And the second one is an RHB 300, which is a 300 mm -hmm. megawatt hour unit. And they come with their own kind of charge and discharge kind of mins and maxes. Okay. Um, but that's, those are our, I would call, um, you know, uh, starting product line. Okay. Um, we think those are the right kind of right size modules. You go after certain market segments, you know, that's, sure. that, that's the, that's the idea for us. Yeah. Okay. Okay. One of the things that did impress me, you know, about you guys too, is that I like the fact that, um, you know, these bricks, you know, they're, they're, and you, and you'll do a better job of kind of eloquently explaining, but there's nothing about, from what I've, what I've seen about your technology that is rare and unique. It's not like you need a metal that you have to get on a planet that's, you know, outside of Mars, or, mm -hmm. you know, you need something that's really hard to get or hard to source it. You're using just regular uh, available products that are in the market today, easily accessible, uh, where the price point is really good. Uh, and you've created a technology around that. I, to me, I think that was part of the genius of of what you guys have done. Is you you have not bottlenecked yourself, as far as I could no. tell. No, not at all. I mean, we even you know, I think I asked one of my team, one of my teammates, to really look at this. This you know, suppose Rondo really blows up, scales everywhere, kind of let's just say it takes over the heat market just for a second. Tell me what sure. the impact that is on our our two core material supply. You yeah. know, wire <laughs> for heater wire. She's right. made of pretty basic stuff and yeah. refractory, the, kind of the brick material. That's right. And it's, it was shocking to me how negligible that looked like compared to yep. the gargantuan scale up of lithium ion or yes. from a very low base, right? All the way there. This, this material is already used in many, many places. So, yep. you know, that, that gave me comfort. Um, and also, I actually oh, yeah. see risks the potential for a centralized supply chain concentration situation. Yep. Where like which is what we're seeing right now with China, um, you know, there, there's a lot of benefits to that. I think for me, the biggest benefit though is on the bankability side. Okay. You know, can heater wire run long enough? Can this material withstand constant thermal cycling? The answer mm -hmm. to both of those 
doesn't necessarily have to be proven by Rondo. You can just point to where they're used. They're working, right? Right. right. Um, what Rondo does is takes that same material and just transforms it in a particular geometry or shape. Right. And then that particular geometry and shape works together in a very innovative ap approach um, that, that creates the ability for us to charge quickly. Ricks don't like to charge quickly. Right? Okay. Ricks don't also, you know, gener generally, uh, um, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's fundamentally, it's about charging quickly while maintaining um, kind, of kind of stability, um, okay. thermal, thermal um, uh, how do we say, um, 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 you know, keep it, keeping the, um, the temperature distribution somewhat even so that you can create a, um, uh, a mechanical st stability in the bricks, okay. right? And generally speaking, bricks don't like, don't do that well, right? They're thermally kind of non-conductive. Yep. Uh, and so it's, it's that geometry and the way it's done that ends up having, ends up allowing you to capture power really quickly. And those, you know, four to six hour charge cycles. Right, um, right. Um, that that's necessary for that the economics that we were talking about to work, right? The, okay. the, the faster I can charge, I think that's a simple rule of thumb with it. Actually, the faster I can charge, the 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 the, the, the these intermittent power uh, sources, faster I can charge from them, the cheaper I can access them. And yeah. and, and and bricks yeah. aren't necessarily the first material you think about to do that, right? And so that there's, right, there's, right. that's really the heart of our thinking. So when you were saying, you know, it's simple, simple on materials. Yeah, like I said, you can you can point to other things to show that they're bankable, right? Use, but the 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 beauty is in the transformation and the exact geometry and physics inside the box, right. uh, and that's our secret sauce. Yeah, yeah. How long will it hold? Um, hold that heat. Which I mean, can it can it hold it a couple of days? I mean, what are we what are we looking at? Yeah, I think in our first product iteration, it's probably that. Um, okay. Um, I think there's you know there's a there's further thought down the line on holding it longer. Okay. Potentially, um, yeah. So, so I think I think right now, you know, but but generally speaking, I'd say you know when we look at our customers right now, not a lot of folks want to hold heat, right? A lot of our industrials are twenty four seven operations, right. looking for that fixed thermal discharge day in day out, right? Um, and and so, you know, that the question of holding heat rarely comes up with with you know extreme exceptional cases. So it's not necessarily a I think we're trying to optimize for right away. Okay. But definitely okay. down the line, I think that I can I see does show up uh, or will show up for as we go deeper and deeper into the into the customers, you know, uh, into the market segment, uh, into into various market segments. Okay. Okay. Is there? I mean, do you think there's a sweet spot there at all? I mean, just to just just in general. I mean, you twenty twenty four to thirty six hours might be plenty. Um, I would say maybe probably forty eight seventy two hours should should okay. be. Uh, and that, but that's for a very specific application that I'm thinking about, which is um, retrofitting, um, you know, a, a coal facility, like taking down a coal boiler, putting in, yeah, okay. putting in a heat battery that's making steam, um, and 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 you, you know that, how that coal plant interacts with the grid. I, I think there's some optimum there of storage. Do you want to hold heat for a period of time? Sure. Um, you know, I think it. Um, I think the short answer to that is, you know. It depends. It depends on where you are. You will find okay. a different optimum amount of storage. I see. I see. From what I've seen in basic analysis right now, it's you know it's probably somewhere in that forty-eight to seventy-two hour range. Okay. Okay. That seems to be. What it, What's your take? I mean, we, you know, kind of thinking about the future here a little bit. What's your take on the next, you know, three, four, five years? Um, and I maybe two ways too, right? Not only Rondo specific, but just. The space in general. I mean, what do you other other ideas, technologies, things are are kind of in the 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 infancy stage that are going to continue to mature that you think is good. Um, I'm curious what your take is on nuclear too. We can get to that in a second. You know, some of these modular nuclear reactors I think are interesting. But we're, let's start with Rondo. What do we? What's your projection over the next three to five on on you know um, development and market share? Yeah, I, I I think I mean right now our biggest competition is just status quo, right? It's fossil yeah. fuel, um, and um, and the the market is so large that I, I I don't think I don't think I don't think technologies like ours should really view each other as competitors fu fu fundamentally. This is way too big of a market. Uh, yeah, 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 and, I agree. Um, 
Right. So, yes. so my perspective on what's about to happen, I'm going to speak from a market perspective, is sure. I think we're in a moment right now today where there's where this this equation of intermittent power versus fossil fuel mm-hmm. is has been solved in sufficient places that like a beachhead market has okay. formed. And so we're going to start to see projects happen. Mm-hmm. And the continuation of building these projects out brings costs down on one side and the continuation right. Our market trend of you know more solar, more wind, cheaper solar, cheaper wind is going to also back the other, but you know the fundamentals of that the power price. Uh, right. time. That that combination of those two things, I think, is going to see us accelerating pretty quickly over the next five years. Okay, um, I would. I think we're going to see many many projects being announced um, um, towards that tail end of those five years. It's going to be kind of not news anymore. Right. It's just business as usual. Yeah. It's business as usual. It's the same way as like, you know, in the, the first few lithium ion projects, you know, everyone knows and by now. Do you know? Do you even look at announcements that say, hey, another? It, it's there's so many. You can't keep up. You can't keep yeah. up. I think I think yeah. we're in we're in that phase right now. That, that's how okay. I see the next five years playing out for the industry as a whole. I think Rondo's very well positioned. Obviously, I'm I'm working there. Um I'm I'm always yeah, yeah. that, uh, but I also believe that. Sure, um, sure. We, can, we can't really get into that without really talking in depth about uh, certain, uh, you know, quite intricate aspects of Rondo. Um, yeah. um, and then, yeah, and then broadly speaking, um, yeah, I'd yeah. say, I think in the next five years, this, you know, we've, I mean, maybe I have a simplistic view here, but, you know, Clean Tech 1.0 came in with, with, with kind of basic, production of energy, solar, wind, and okay. production of renewable energy. And right. I think this clean tech 2.0, and, and, and of course, like electric vehicles, this clean tech, I think 2.0 wave, um, if you want to call it that, is going to show up with, you know, like you, you brought up nuclear, other ways of also making that same energy because, right. you know, solar and wind do have limitations, yep. do have, you know, we're seeing issues on, on the grid, et cetera. Yep. There's ways to address that, and there you know there's different ways of making that energy. I, I think I think what's going to be really interesting in the next five years is the, the user of power, on the other side to replace certain things that we, um, we're taking for uh, for granted. And I think that is industry. Um, I think that's production of fuel or e-fuels. Um, okay. I think we're going to see. Um, not necessarily the the the, the production of e fuels you know, purely from electricity, but I think we're going to start to see um, next five years. I think we're going to see um, a lot of interesting developments on industrial T car broadly. You got heat pumps, you got carbon capture and storage, etc. We're going to start to see pilots all across um, in that space. Um, we're going to start to see cement decarbonization, steel decarbonization, all of these sort of pilots. I don't know where they're going to go. Um, and that I'm not privy to the technical, technical economics of each of them and exactly why they make sense the way they do. Right, right. Um, but I think we're going to see green steel and green cement, uh, you know, and, and, and green fuels as, as pilots really, really, really soon here in the next few years. I mean, okay. looking at just the, the announcements that I'm seeing right now and, and the continued increase in announcements, I mean, hopefully those projects do get funded. We right, right. There's a large ratio between announcements to funding. Um, but it's going to be an interesting space. I think by 2030, um, if we're really serious about um, uh, climate change, I feel like it's, it's a good moment to look back at all these experiments. Sure. And I think we can chart a data-informed path, uh, you know, and, and really talk about you know, mm-hmm. what are things that are just going to be really, really hard and need support? Um, what are some mm-hmm. things, and so Joe, maybe this is where I can get controversial here, is I think there are certain things that are just not going to be cheaper than fossil fuel. And I they think- They will not be cheaper than fossil. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are certain things that will just not be, you know, and, 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 you know, maybe that's controversial, but I think for those things, we might have to, as a society, kind of acknowledge that. Um, and adapt around that. And I think, you know, looking at looking at things in 2030, looking back at these things, uh, these, uh, these, these various demonstrations, yeah. is an yeah. interesting time, I think, for us. Um, yeah. It's kind of my my little, like, little take of, of the next five years. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I mean, I think you made a good point there at the end, though. I mean, I, you have to kind of take responsibility for your actions. And, and to your point, um, 
I, you know, my personal belief is, you know, I'm, I'm not a, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think there's interesting mixes of power. Um, and I, I think now we, we can lean on all of them. And, and I think that that's appropriate. I, I think that, that those percentages will change over time, but to your point, if you want to move away from something that is cheaper to something that's more expensive, you just have to accept that consequence. You have to know that the cost of the good or the service being provided will increase but that's what you want. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you can't have the double speak of, you know, well, I, I would prefer X and the you know, reality is my, you know, my, my power bill has gone up 18%. I, I don't, I don't like that. And it's like, well, but that was the trade, you know? And so I, I think as long as, you know, people are honest, I mean, to me, that goes a long ways uh, because you don't have to like it, but you can accept it. You know, um, we, you know, you I just, yeah. Don't want to live in a delusional world. Right. So I, uh, I think that's a good point. Um, I mean, I, I, one I, I, of the I, I, things I want to catch up with you on before we we yeah. wind down today's show is I've I've kind of got two other questions I want to throw at you. One is um, what um, what's the best piece of advice that you've received? Mm-hmm. And I mean whether it's it's personal or professional, and sometimes those overlap because it, it can apply in both places, or you can go either place. But I'm curious, you know what. What's a guiding piece of advice um, that's that's just served you well, you know, um, throughout your career? Something that perhaps you lean back on, maybe something a mentor told you or shared with you uh, that you you keep coming back to as a real, you know, stalwart, you know. Uh, for that's you. a good question, uh, Joe. And you're catching me at an interesting time. So, I, you know, one thing is coming up. I don't I don't know if I necessarily live by it all the time or, sure. you know, it's on top of mind uh, per se, but it does come up frequently um, for yeah. me. Um, and it's it's an advice I got during a turnaround that, you know, the, a good leader um, it essentially is the opposite, operates in an opposite way to his team. Kind of the team is feeling good. Leader should be pessimistic a little bit, you know, paranoid. Okay. okay. Really good. You got to be the light. So okay. you kind of, kind of always just keep, keep, keep that, keep that picture in your, in your okay. mind. And I think that's served me well. Okay. Uh, you know, um, for instance, when things are going well, I, I kind of feel like I got to look at the flanks, like what's going on. <laughs> yeah. 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 Things aren't going well. I'm like, you know, I, I'm, I, I turn into a different energy. And sure. I think that's sure. me well in my career. Um, it's certainly okay. serving me well right now. So it's top of mind because, because of the things I'm uh, currently working on. Yeah. yeah, yeah, perfect. No, it's great. It's love it. I've never heard that piece of advice, but I, I like it. That's it's one of the things I like about sitting in this seat is I I, I get a lot of these little nuggets, you know. But um, that's that's good. I'm going to put that in the toolbox, you know, for myself. Um, one of the other questions I got too is when you, you know, part of it is you know just kind of looking at your day, right? Everybody's got a different routine. Um, you know how they start their day, how they move through their day, how they end their day, um, and that's something that we've talked about on the show with, with people, you know, many times. And, but one of the things that I, I find interesting is that, um, yeah, I mean, some people get up early, some late, you know, everybody's kind of all over the map. And then, you know, quite frankly, someone in your position, you could start off with a day looking like this and then it, it goes to that, you know, it's like, uh, well, you know, we had great plans at 8am and by four o'clock, <laughs> six o'clock that night where it's very different. Right. But one of the things that I, that I want to kind of, kind of get an insight on you on is what, what what is it in your day that's kind of non-negotiable um or you know what 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 is there in your day or let's say you know four out of five days a week that i i i I do this or i have to do it or have to be a part of my day because it really anchors me in some capacity to Mm -hmm. allow me to do what what it is i i do every day that's interesting uh joe and it's something it, it's it's interesting because it's definitely on my mind right now. Um, uh-huh. I don't have the daily anchor. Yep. I have the weekly anchor. Okay. Um, and, um, but the daily anchor is something that I have always kind of wanted and worked towards. And I find that you know uh-huh. certain stick, but then you know I get I got kind of uh, you know kicked from the side, and I kind of lose I lose it. And I, you know it's so I'm. I'm um, I'm not yeah. good at building those strong habits that way, but there are weekly habits that are very strong for me. Um, sure. You know, I have on, a, on a weekly hike with my wife. Weekly we hike, okay. Hours out there with the dog. Necessary. It's like a reset. I feel like yep. that's that's the moment, yep. you know, you let go of what happened and kind of face the new. 
Yep. Yep. I love it. Making, making, um, making food. So I, I love cooking. I cook, oh, you know, okay. cook food from, from my, from my, uh, you know, kind of family, family dishes, uh, it, especially now that I'm kind of far away. It's like a way yeah. for me to be able to close. Um, yeah. we do, we do that in the weekends together. Okay. So that, you know, necessary cooking is kind of, a almost my meditation. Uh, yeah, so having, yeah. So having those two and knowing that they're always there at the end of the week, I think yeah. is, is, is just a thing to look forward to. But I, I, on, on that daily thing, it startups are, are, are crazy. I mean, I, I started the week, Joe, with, 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 you know, kind of a half empty schedule. I'm like, Hey, this is going to be a nice week by, by, I think by around 10 AM on Monday, gone. And I, I, I drove all the way down to Bakersfield and back and I wasn't even off schedule this week. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> so it's it's no that's it's it's hard it's hard to to, yeah. to keep yourself that you can you know maybe maintain some sort of a, yeah. a completely um you know fixed thing uh when, when you're when you're uh, when you're driving so quickly and you got to be flexible and adaptable yeah. in a startup yeah 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 i appreciate you sharing that and and also you know um you're right the 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 the, the flexibility and adaptability the fluidity of of if you want to be in a startup, right? Sometimes I, I get asked that question and it's like, you, you kind of have to embrace it. And I think for some people it's easier than others, but that's, that's, that's kind true. of the but life. You don't want to, you know, like I, how do I say, I, maybe the best way to explain this for me is like, I don't want to end up resisting. Yeah. Right. It's like, oh, but I have this thing that I really need to do. And so I can't be adaptable or flexible. Um, right. And then you end up either resenting the startup or you end up feeling so I, I think I think the right mentality is just fluidity. I'm not saying the startup's gonna blow up your week and you're gonna work nonstop. No, absolutely not. There's there's sprints and there's slowdowns and it's it's a marathon. Um yeah. I think yeah. I tend to operate a little bit more fluidly. There's not I, I you know, I, I hold things I, I I hold I hold things quite loosely. Uh yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot yeah, of things. Yeah. Still- That's good though. I mean, I get I I I I like that. The hike and the cooking, you know, kind of kind of bringing you back. And um, I think it's interesting too, because there's some people that that really can't answer that question. And that's always a bit of a pause for me because it's, you, you have to have a way to sort of recharge the battery to, you got to step away. Um, I mean, you can kind of look at it like a battery. I mean, once you use it, it, yeah. I, I mean, literally until you charge it again, it, it, it has nothing to give. And if yeah. your goal is to, is to serve and to give, and, and to drive and to push and to encourage and support, you know, if you ain't got anything in the tank, you, you can't fundamentally do what I think professionally you're looking to do. Right. So Absolutely. I, I, I think it's incumbent that we, we step back um, and, and find those, those ways to, uh, to keep, yeah. to keep yourself balanced. Yeah. You know, yeah, like so. really listening to yourself, you know, like, um, you know, I, I try, I try to run and uh, uh, some weeks I'm not good at it. And some weeks I find the time, but, yeah. Some days, yeah. I'm like, I need to run. And I'm like, yes. I'm not going to run. <laughs> <I have> to. <laughs> oh, so I hear you. That's, that's, that's how it's been. Uh, that's how I've been playing this. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Well, I mean, I, um, we're, we're about out of time. So I, um, I don't know any other, I like to throw it out there. Any of the final thoughts, you know, on anything that we've talked about, anything flow through your mind that you didn't get a chance to lean in on that you'd like to hit right before we, we wind down. I think I think we covered we covered quite a bit. Um, um, I'm excited. I'm, I'm I'm quite excited for um, um, uh, you know in, in, the, in this in this in, in Rondo right now. Um, I'm excited for where the industry is heading. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I certainly there's a feeling I have right now in the industry that feels very different than three or four years ago. A lot a lot more, okay. a lot a lot of customers pulling, asking. It's not like you're knocking on a door and they're like, "What what do you mm-hmm. got? What are you?" It's like people right. know like they're doing their research there's there's definitely sustainability managers and there's there's levels of thinking that i think i just haven't seen even four years ago um so i think wow. we're in a very really interesting time um, yeah. I do think we're going to do a lot of experiments right now not a lot of them are going to be successful but i yep. think that's we'll do it in waves and let's see what clean tech 3.0 looks like um yeah yeah that settles on whatever we've made our bets on right now yeah. Yeah. That's exciting. That's exciting. I, I love that. I mean, that's a great little final kind of segue out is that, you know, I like uh, the idea there's receptivity, you know, that, that there are companies that are, that are, you know, looking at their outward facing, you know, um, instead of always inward facing. And then when, if they're not aware, at least they're open to the conversation to kind of see where it goes, where before I think that could have been a tough nut to crack, as you say, you know, some number of years back. So, um, 
to me, that that all points in the right direction. That's positive. That's good. And not all deals will happen, but but enough will. I, yeah. I'm bullish. I, I you know, I it's just a matter of time. It's the the die is cast. The momentum is there. It's, that's what it is. Fundamentally, it's just a matter of time. Like you know, we live on a with a finite resources on a planet with a very thin atmosphere. We we just you know, that's it's 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 just the right thing to do. At the end yeah, of the day, yeah. we're, gonna, we're gonna do it as humans. We have to. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you making some time. Thank you for uh, for being on the show today. It's uh, fun and uh, glad we did it. It's always fun to chat. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I just want to remind everybody. Remember, there's a genius inside of all of us. It's up to you to discover it harness it and share it with the world. So the real question is, what's your inner genius? This is the Padua Podcast Network. Padua Podcast Network.com.